the Vanguard series of heavy fighters in Star Citizen are a popular choice for players looking for a beefed up combat platform, and the Harbinger variant says, hey, if you're taking the Vanguard out, you should bring some torpedoes along with you, just in case. But how does the Harbinger actually perform in game? I'm Farrister, and in this video we'll explore the answer to that question by reviewing the currently flyable Aegis Vanguard Harbinger which is somewhat interestingly described on the Star Citizen website as a bomber. If you've seen other reviews on this channel then you probably know what to expect, with this video following the usual format. It's split into 5 sections, starting with the ship tour, assessing combat performance, reviewing handling and visibility, looking at the operating costs before finally summarising. As always, I've included timestamps in the video description in case you want to skip ahead. And if you're one of the many people watching who isn't yet subscribed to the channel, you might consider it so you can be notified of future Star Citizen videos as they go live. And we'll start the tour for the Vanguard by heading straight up the rear ramp at the back of the ship. The Vanguard is split into three sections and we'll start with the rearmost. This is the section that contains the ramp that brings you up into the ship itself as well as a small door, which leads to component access for the Quantum Drive. In this middle section, this is where the habitation sort of area of the Vanguard is. There's a storage box, and a small bathroom. Please ignore the sand on the floor. It's your usual shower, and sticking out toilet combination. There are two beds for crew use, because this is, in theory, a two person long range ship. There's a weapons rack, a small kitchen area, and lots of little storage bins like this small rack. And of course you can see through to those large torpedo munitions in the glass window. This section also houses access to the turret. The turret on the top of the Vanguard Harbinger is by default equipped with rocket pods but can be changed out. The turret is nothing unusual, pretty much what you'd come to expect. You've got the buttons that you can press to activate the different modes, and that's just about it. We'll leave the turret and head back into the body of the ship. And we'll finish by moving towards the front. It is worth adding, there is a little hidden storage bin underneath the stairs here. And as we move through, there is more component access on each of the walls. And right at the front is the cockpit chair for the pilot. The Vanguard Harbinger comes heavily armed. The pilot armament is a size 5 mount, by default a gimbal with size 4 ballistic cannon, and with additional 4 size 2 weapons on the nose. Those fixed weapons, although size 2, can only be swapped for other Vanguard fixed weapons, so whilst you can change the ballistic cannons to laser repeaters for example, they're the Vanguard proprietary ones. The man turret has 2 size 3 weapons on it, by default, they're two Jericho rocket pods, which are not as useful as you might hope in the current patch, so worth swapping out. And in terms of missiles, you get a lot. There are four size 4 hardpoints that you might expect from the Warden, with a default loadout of 8 size 2 and 4 size 3 missiles. But there's also an additional size 5 hardpoint, which carries three size 5 torpedoes, and are the real unique selling point for the Harbinger. 
Defensively, you're equipped with two size 2 shield generators, which makes for a good defensive performance and is more than you get with a Hurricane or Scorpius for example. It's by no means invincible and you'd still need to treat engagements like you're in a fighter, but it's enough defensive power to stay in the melee for a bit longer. Put all of that together and you've got a really solid combat brawler, especially against NPC opponents. The firepower is enough to deal with a range of targets, especially when augmented with those big torpedoes, and the turret gives an option for a friend to come along and fight along too. So a bit of a combat powerhouse while still remaining in the fighter category. With the cockpit right at the front of the fighter, visibility out of the Vanguard is pretty good, especially to the front and sides. There are a couple of struts in the glasswork, but once you're in combat, you're likely weaving and rolling such as not really to notice them. In terms of handling, the Vanguard is a heavy fighter and feels like it. It's still more manoeuvrable than some of the big multi-crew ships, but you'll feel a bit less nimble than some of the smaller ships. Acceleration to the top speed of 1022 meters per second feels quite quick with the thrust from the twin engines at the back, but slowing down is noticeably slower. The SCM speed limiter is also relatively high when compared to the translation and rotation performance at 171 meters per second. So if you're using the default limiter, you'll want to be aware that the ship can feel a little sluggish. All in all, the braking performance is what you'll notice, taking a little time to slow down at any speed. Notably, deploying the landing gear makes the wings fold forward and back, a bit like you might see on the swept wings of a variable geometry fighter jet, which means that the Vanguard takes up marginally less space in a hangar when the gear is down. The stock quantum drive is unusually pretty good, with the Jaeger offering good speed and the fuel tanks large enough to get good coverage across the Stanton system. The Harbinger is larger than some other fighters, so expect the costs to increase too. The cross rearming, refueling and repairs expect into the thousands or even tens of thousands of Alpha UEC, depending on what you've been up to. But it can also be very profitable to run. The mainstay of earning a living with the Vanguard series is combat contracts, and the Harbinger does a great job of holding up that reputation. Pretty much any of the ship to ship combat contracts are feasible with careful piloting, supported by those large torpedo armaments. There is a little space in the back which makes delivery contracts feasible too, if you wanted to take a break from the fight for a little bit. By way of loadout changes, I'd suggest only swapping out the weapons to personal preference. Keeping the gimbal on the main gun is advantageous, but perhaps swapping to an energy weapon like a Rhino Repeater might suit longer haul combat runs. Equally, swapping the four specialised size 2 to the same, like the GVSR, might be a good bet, and likewise for the gunner armament, potentially for two Panther Repeaters. Most of the other components come mil-spec as standard, but for somebody min-maxing the ship, there may be some further tweaks, although in my opinion, not strictly necessary. The Harbinger is a solid performer as a combat platform, especially against AI targets. It takes the beefy brawler feel of the Vanguard and adds those big torpedoes, which make dealing with larger targets a little more accessible. There's room for a gunner, so you can fly with a friend, but equally there's plenty of firepower behind the pilot stick, so it's not a requirement. And there are the internal creature comforts that may become more useful as time goes on. Things like physical space inside the ship for boxes or similar, as well as the two beds, help to feed into the image of the Vanguard as a long range fighter. The in-game price at just over 2 million Alpha UEC is also very competitive. It's much cheaper than the Warden and sits at a price bracket that is fairly accessible to somebody who is happy to grind for a bit to make ends meet. And for that, you get a ship capable of paying off the bill fairly quickly. For an out-of-game purchase, the $290 or so that you'd pay is a little harder to stomach. 
The combat performance is still good with the Vanguard Harbinger, but I don't know that I paid three times as much as the Arrow in real cash for example. For my money, as much as I like the Harbinger, I'd buy in-game and save the cash. But maybe you disagree, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the video comments. As always, if you're not yet subscribed, you might consider it if you got this far, to give YouTube the nudge to suggest similar videos to you in the future. And it would also be really helpful to me if you would press that like or dislike button to guide me as to what videos you're enjoying the most, so I can focus on making the most relevant videos in the future. Otherwise, and as always, thank you for watching.